the life of those that I love and the life of the church and how great is our God. And I don't know how he got us through. And I don't know, I, I don't know, I don't understand. But I know that those that call upon him, he'll answer. He'll answer. Those that, that believe and those that call upon him. And, you know, sometimes the, as years go by in the Lord and, and, and we've seen so much and God has been so good to us, we can kind of get a little of the humdrum or, or we, don't, um, we don't fire ourselves up again, you know. We take so many things for granted, myself included. But God, but God. But God, and then he brings a situation into our lives that may trouble the waters a little bit, just to remind us that he loves us, that he pulls us through, and he calms the storms, and he soothes the broken heart. Amen. He wins every battle. Every battle. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. It's good to be back home. <laughs> Pass his boat. Because <laughs> he drove back from Florida, and that was not the way to go. We are flying the next time we have to go. But, um, <laughs> sure. yeah, that was a bit too long for these old bodies and, um, and all that goes along with it. Uh, I know where every bathroom stop is, 195. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, but it's good to see you all, and it's good to be back, and it's good to be with our family. We had the experience of going to a mega church while we were down there. Um, I've never been in a mega church, and um, there's one right in my daughter's community. They build communities down here. They're like walled cities, you know, and... Um, Lord, we went to the 8.30 service. The parking lot was packed. You know, so, um, you know, we go in and, and, and there's a whole protocol. You know, they kind of just wind, you know, you get lined up and you walk in and you sit, you know, it's all very organized. It has to be for that many people. And um, during worship, we start to worship. I'm looking around and I'm seeing young, old, black, white, Every representation of, uh, uh, of our culture here, at least in the United States, most of which had their arms up praising the Lord. And I said, you know what, God? They're still on the throne. There's still a people. There's still a remnant crying out, pleading with you, calling upon you, declaring your works. You're not done with us yet. You're not done with this country yet. Amen. The media would like you to believe something different, but what I saw was just breathtaking. Breathtaking. And, um, of course, you know, they, you would have, oh my goodness gracious, I mean, the worship team, what they had in instrumentation and technology was incredible. But you know what? The songs are the same songs we sing here. And people still, it doesn't count unless you're lifting your voice up to the Lord. Amen. He doesn't care about um, everything else. He cares about our hearts and where we're at. So just remember that word of Jesus. Uh, we're a mighty force here for the kingdom of God. Amen. We may not be many right now, but we are certainly mighty. Because God listens to those that are pure in heart and call upon him. So that was part of our experience, but um, it was it, it was great to get back and uh, and be here this morning. Amen. So I don't know, Jim, are you Bill Brugel? <laughs> but you are daily missed. And I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone. Um, um, I'm going to put it on my heart. I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians. It's a common one, but just a little reminder again. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing in, in everything. Give thanks. In, not for. Say it again. In 
everything that we are going through right now. Mm -hmm. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right, so, well, we just come and give you our offerings and thanks for that, knowing that you are with us in what we are going through, knowing that you will never leave us or forsake us, and we cannot do it without you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just lift this up to you, this offering as a blessing to you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God is so good. All the time. All the time, yeah. He is so, so good. Wow. I tell you, coming back was like re-entry. <laughs> Florida is foreign. It's, it really is. It's Long Island with palm trees, but that's the only similarity. Very, very different. And we, we've made many trips uh, to Florida in the past and drove down and drove to the West Coast. So that was a longer trip than this one. This we only, only went down 95 um, into Fort St. Lucie. But it was a very different trip because years ago, you were comfortable at 70. In fact, if your car could do 70, you were right up there with the rest of them. Now, if you do 70, you think you stalled and you almost get out to see what's wrong. Yeah, 90, 95 consistently, continuously. It's like driving the Indy 500. And it's, no, it's, it's a constant. Driving used to be so relaxing. And it wasn't always so many people. And um, I always found that and if I could find a trucker and stay behind a trucker, I'd be all right. Because those guys, they would not anymore. They're in all three lanes. They're passing each other. They're, you know, if you drift and you get thrown past the exit before you knew you were there. It, it's very, very different. But it, it kind of bears out what um, Daniel said at the close of his book, that um, in the last days, not only would knowledge increase, but the implication is that everything is speeded up. Everything is happening faster than it used to. Um, it's just, it, it's all around us. Not just knowledge increasing, but what does that imply? It used to take decades for things to change. It used to take a lot of time to implement a change, but not anymore. We, we truly are. I guess every generation after Jesus believed they were living in what they thought were the last days. And whether these be the last days or our last days, we're so much closer today than we ever were before. So whether Jesus comes back for us individually or collectively, he's coming. He's coming back. And that, that seems to be a message. I, I, I don't have a, a, a feel-good message this morning, and, and I really didn't get it till around 4.30 this morning. The Lord so thoughtfully broke me at 12.30, and again at 4.30, and I decided, well, he didn't let me sleep, so I might as well get up. Um, and we put together a message a familiar message, but I think a timely message. One that we need to, to hear. One that we need to consider. One that, that um, we really need to uh, give some serious thought to. 
because it affects who we are, how we perceive ourselves, how we have a walk with the Lord, and whether or not we're playing church, whether we're misdirected or spot on. I don't, I don't, you know, it's going to be very different for each and every one of us because there, while there are many different levels in our relationships, we never attain the fullness of our relationship with the Lord until we stand before him. So this is, this is our proving ground. This is the place where we apply ourselves. This is the place where we take in what the Word of God says to us and we decide, well, I like this or I'll apply that. Oh, this is a promise. I'm, I want that. You know, we don't cherry pick the Word of God, but we prayerfully and carefully consider what is God saying to his people? What is he saying to everybody? And what is he saying, not only uh, to the newbies, but how about some of the oldies? You know, all of us can learn. All of us can be refreshed by the Word of God. We can, um, we can be expanded in our understanding. And there's a danger there, because we want to understand God, which is impossible. And that's, that's a fool's pursuit. But we can know God. We can know, have an intimacy with God. And, and I heard it defined one time that intimacy is God saying, into me, see. He wants us to know him. He wants us to be aware. He wants us to draw closer to him. And it's not imagery. It's reality. It's relationship. Jesus never came to start a movement. He never came um, uh, uh, for fame and, and glory. He already had it. It was his all along. But he came to connect us to him and to each other. Just that simple. To him and to each other. And unless we have a desire to draw nearer to him and to be able to accept and, you know, maybe it's not accept. No, it's not. And I thought of this as we were in, in, in Florida because with our daughter's heart attack, the suddenness of it, the, the circumstances surrounding it, she is not accepting uh, a heart attack at her tender age of 47. She's not um, accepting the prognosis that she's ultimately a, uh, a candidate for a heart transplant. She will not accept that her heart is only functioning at 30%. And it's not about accepting. That's not going to change anything. What she has to do is adapt to the circumstances that exist and work with it. Uh, I'm not a, a martial arts person um, and, and I don't have a gym membership. Um, but I understand in martial arts, the thing that, that, that they stress and that they teach and that causes you to be successful is when someone is attacking you you simply take the force that they're bringing and continue it. And so you take their thrust and their force and boom, you just take them down. And not, not by ducking, you know, but by grabbing and, and continuing them because they're coming at you. Well, circumstances come at us mm -hmm. and we are under assault. And the body of Christ is fair game. And I... I am somewhat convinced, I, I, I hate to use the word I believe because then people say, oh, he teaches this or that. No, I, I, I assume or assess from looking at things that are going on all around us that the enemy has pulled out the stops. I believe he knows his time is short. 
and therefore he wants to smack us upside the head, take us down, take us out in any way he can. Because we represent not only the body of Christ, but the person of Christ. Because Jesus said, if we believe in him, then he would come and dwell in us. And that, that sets our enemy. Um, yeah, yeah, he, he just, oh, he can't stand it. That we would serve the one true living God. And um, again, it's, this is not a denominational thing. It's a relationship thing. It matters that we know him. He knows us, but do we know him? And, and um, you know, I, I, I had said that, you know, use the analogy of, you know, the increased speed on, on the expressways and, and throughways, but also, you know, um, Peter and John in their epistles tell us these are the signs of the times. Scoffers. People make fun of them. You go to church, why do you waste your time? <laughs> why, do you, why do you give your money to that? You know, you got to go back next week. You, you just never get enough, you know. Um, they got you. They just bring you in and, and hook you and keep you. And what's the matter with you? You know? What, what's the matter with us? I don't know. Um, but I can I can testify that um, after nearly 44 years of walking with the Lord, listen, I I never understood this statement when I first heard it, but I understand it now. If there is no heaven, just for a minute, imagine there was no heaven to gain, no hell to avoid. Walking in God's ways have so improved our lifestyle. Now, we didn't get to, to miss all the problems. We didn't get to duck all the dangers. We didn't escape all the challenges. But somehow, living God's way makes all the difference and makes it doable and bearable. And we have been surrounded by um, adversity and the kind of news you never want to receive. Losing, losing friends um, and uh, family members to COVID. Um, seeing people um, get crushed because they're in ministry and, and, and they're, they're advancing the kingdom of God and they're targeted and they're being pulled down and slammed around. But not giving up, but watching these things. You know, I, I'm, we're in the, in the process of doing a Bible study at, uh, where, where we live, and um, we're in the Book of Job. <laughs> That's kind of timely. And um, everybody, you know, Job, why don't you just, you know, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, how much are you going to put up with? We haven't been tested anything like that. But, but it, it, when the, when the, when the going gets rough, we're tough, the tough get going. We have every reason to believe that the grace of God is with us to face every challenge, every adversity, every, every situation. We may get caught short. We may not see it coming. We may not always heed the warning signs. But in the midst of it, you're never alone. You're never in it by yourself. You belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and knowing that, we sometimes do wonder, Lord, did, did you single me out? I, I, I know the first time I read Job, I said, boy, I don't want him to ever brag on me. You know, I just, I just let me be normal and, and part of the masses. I, I don't want to be special, and, and I sure don't want to be tested like that. Just a reminder, God never tempts us. He may test us. The enemy tempts us. But God doesn't test us, that he doesn't supply the grace necessary that we would pass that, that test. And that's all my introduction. Um, there seems to be, along with the scoffers we were told about, have you noticed there's um, 
just a general disinterest in God. Just like, so what? Uh, is, you think there's a God? I don't. You know, um, we both pay the same price at the toll booth or, you know, for the gym membership or whatever. Um, and, you know, there's no discount with God. Or, you know, if it works for you, that's nice. How many people have said that to me? Well, if that works for you. But what works for you? Hopping on one foot, you know? Um, doing a, a, a mantra. You know, but put, put a bag over your head so you don't see light. How, what fools these mortals be, you know? But God has a plan, and he set that plan in motion. But sometimes it's so easy and so simple. We look for a complicated way to serve God. Begin with the Tower of Babel. Let's build the tower to heaven, you know? Let's reach out to God. Elicit that religion in every way, shape, and, and form. We're going to please God. We're going to do some, we're going to do things so nice he's going to notice us. We could not reach him. And in our frustration and in our desperation, God said, let me reach out to them. Let me, let me reach down and, and let me, because they'll never make it to here. So I'm going to have to go to them. And he sent his son. And that's what we're about. That's Christianity. God reaching out to us. Certainly not us um, discovering God. And I want to begin um, by revisiting Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16. And um, I begin in verse 13. And it's a familiar passage. But we're going to open it up a little differently. We're going to look at it maybe from a, a, a different perspective. But hopefully, hopefully it's going to speak differently to each of us where we're at. Because it, it is the word of the Lord, and it just so happens um, it's in red, so it deserves a little <coughs> extra attention. But verse 13 of Matthew 16 says this, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples one little question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, did Jesus have an identity problem? Wasn't he sure uh, of his gospel and his call? Um, did he want to, you know, well, let's, let's check the stats. You know, what are people saying about us? How are we doing? You know, how are we graded on last week's message? No. He asked a question of his disciples, those closest to him, those who walked with him, ate with him, slept with him, and moved from place to place, gave up their livelihoods and followed him. And he, and he says to them, you know, what's the scuttlebutt? What do you hear from the crowds? Every place we go, what are they saying? They answered him. And they said in verse 14, some say John the Baptist. Wow. Let's stop for a minute and consider John. John the Baptist. Who was John? Wow. He was a relative of Jesus. He was his cousin, I guess second cousin, because Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, so their children were next level second cousins. John and, and Jesus were related. But John also was called by God from the womb to go out and declare, you know, that the Messiah was coming, that the promise that God had made, year, hundreds, maybe even hundreds plus years prior, was about to unfold. That God was fulfilling a promise he had made. And John the Baptist went in the wilderness. But his message was simple and straightforward. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Straighten up and fly right. Get your act together, guys. 
God is going to move in our midst. And he's fulfilling a promise. And he's sending his Messiah. Why would they suggest he was John the Baptist? John was very different than Jesus. But something had happened to John. And if we, if we look um, in chapter 14, just back up a little bit. Um, in chapter 14, I'll pick it up in verse 7. Oops, no, that's not 14, is it? Ha-ha. Chapter 14 of Matthew's Gospel. At that time, Herod the Tetra heard the news about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Boy, when the world's confused, the church ought to have their act together. But he heard about Jesus. He said, That's John. Oh, my. He says he has risen. This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. For when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. You see, uh, two brothers, both positions of authority. But one was fooling around with his brother's wife. And John confronted him. Said, shouldn't do that. It's not nice. You know? God, God's not going to support that, that kind of thing. You know? Let me warn you. Well, Herodias, the woman, um, she, didn't, uh, she didn't respond all that well. Um, but John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. The people were coming to John in droves. They were getting baptized at the Jordan River. But who was coming? The ordinary? The, the regular folk? Not, certainly not the religious. Certainly not the Pharisees or the Sadducees, the ruling, ruling bodies of the Jews. No, this was a threat to them. But people got the message. Just like people get the message of Jesus. People, every now and again, somebody of some prominence, be it an athlete or a, a, a performer or a politician or somebody of, of wealth or, or position, comes to Christ. Whoa, that's news. You and I, nobody noticed. Well, that's not true. Our family did, and they said, don't worry, this too will pass. <laughs> you face that? Yeah. Wasn't that lovely, huh? Listen, I got saved. God, God's straightening out my life. All right, honey, sit down. Maybe, maybe you need to eat, you know? <laughs> um, couldn't. Well, 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 we were as ignorant as, as our folks were. But God had done something. And when you encounter the reality of who Christ is, you are changed. You either accept with, with, with such glee and, 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 and gratitude and uh, whatever, or you reject it with vehemence and just turn against it. I don't need that. I'm all right. I, you know, I'm okay. You're okay. I'm not so sure about you. You know? What is it? You can't just tolerate Jesus. You either receive him or you flat out reject him. But you know what? He doesn't get upset. And he persists. And he comes a different way. He'll keep coming. His love is greater than our rejection. And he'll persist. And it seems to me he always gets what he wants. Thank God for that. But they, he continues. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. And he read that already. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. So much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Having been prompted by her mother, she said, 
Give me here on the platter the head of John the Baptist. Wow, how convenient. Hmm. But be careful who you criticize. Be, be careful who, who you, you come against. So, some people have the authority to, to do you some harm, and it can hurt. But that was it. But John, John stood before the Lord and said, mission accomplished. He had done what God had called him to do. And tons of people, we don't have any numbers. I, there's no baptismal records uh, you know, uh, down by the Jordan. But John baptized multitudes. The word went out. And the people he baptized took the word and went with it, like we're supposed to do. This is, Christianity is not a selfish situation. It's personal because it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but it's not selfish. It's the kind of thing you have to share. You want to share. You want others to know what God has done for you. What is it? Uh, it's no secret what God can do, what he did for others. He do for you. You know, it's so simple to share what, what God has, has done. So they thought, well, people are saying you're John the Baptist. Well, was it people or was it, you know, did that come down from higher up? But that was their, their first response. Others say Elijah. Wow. Why, why would they think that um, he was Elijah? Because at the end of Malachi, the end, the last book of the Old Testament, the end of Malachi, there's a promise. In chapter 4 and verse 4, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, here it is, pay attention. I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. God promised. Now, where, where was Elijah? Well, he, he got in this chariot and was taken up. He, he was in heaven. He, he was enjoying uh, the rewards of his ministry. What is, but God says, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Wow. So Elijah's coming back in a chariot, and all I get is a horse? <laughs> Amazing. How is he coming back? Well, um, Jesus answered that himself. And um, uh, and I wrote it down, and I, oh, yes, yes. They also said Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But in Matthew 11, Matthew had a lot to tell us. He didn't do it necessarily chronologically. But in Matthew 11, verses 7 to 14, here's what you, let me give it to you as it's written. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John, John the Baptist. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What, you know, what was the attraction? What were you looking for? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. This is Jesus speaking to this group. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Does that make you feel good? Because as a child of God, you're in the kingdom. You're right up there. Maybe even a little bit ahead of John. 
from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Jesus, talking about the spirit of Elijah, having been placed on John and John's ministry and his call to the ordinary person who religion had kept at bay. But you can't read the scrolls. We'll tell you what they say. You, you're, not a, you know, you're not able to really understand it. It's kind of, you know, you got to be gifted. you gotta be, you got to be elevated. you got to, you know, wear certain robes to be able to understand this. I'm told that this Bible's written on a fourth grade level. Isn't that wonderful that all of us can read the Word of God and understand it and glean from it and, and, and be blessed by it? You don't need. I remember years ago, how, how many are familiar with Chuck Smith's ministry, Calvary Chapel, right? Years ago, up in Costa Mesa, California, when he first started his radio broadcast, we used to listen because he would call um, Pastor Nick at... Um, Church of Praise, and everybody would gather around. Oh, it's Pastor Chuck. You know, somebody on the radio, actually, you could talk to him and listen to him on the phone. But when his radio broadcast began, he used to uh, preview his message by doing questions and answers. People would write in or send questions or whatever. And somebody wrote to him and said, um, Pastor Chuck, I'm, I'm kind of new in, in this born again thing, I'm new in the Lord. He says, and I'm having trouble understanding the scriptures. He said, should I, should I find a teacher? Should I hire a tutor to explain the word to me? Chuck thought for a moment. He said, no. He said, find a student. Find somebody you're going to teach. And watch how the word opens up. Watch how you get understanding in the word as you share it with someone else. Watch what the Holy Spirit does. That's, we, don't be afraid of this book. And don't think you need to understand every sentence or every paragraph or every chapter or, or even the continuity. Put it in. And the Holy Spirit will pull it out at, at the opportune time. Get the word in you. You've got to get into the word. You will never know the God of this word unless you know the word of God. That's, that's, that's so, so vital. Anyway, back to um, Jesus' question. And so they said, um, they said, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Well, was he just a prophet? Hmm. Why did he have to be one that had passed? Oh, well, some of them, I guess, believed in reincarnation. So that guy didn't get it right, so he's back for a second chance. No, it's not the way God works. He said to them, and this, this is the question um, that's facing us today. Well, who do you say that I am? Not you collectively, but you individually. Where's Jesus in your lineup? Who do you say that he is? Now, what he's, he's asking, what's the opinion? What's, what's the scuttlebutt? What, what's going on? What are folks saying? Um, public opinion constantly changes. And that, those were the answers they gave him. Why? Because that's what they were familiar with. Today, I believe that people would say, well, Jesus is everything from... And I've seen some interviews, a myth. Some people say, no, I don't think he really lived. I don't think there was such a person. So you're entitled to, to that opinion. But people who have never heard of him or have heard of him, you know, it, it smatters, uh, little dribbles and drabs and bits and pieces, wouldn't, wouldn't have any idea who he is. Um, or he's a historical person of influence. Wow, there's, there's a definition. 
He's a, a man who did much good, you know, kind of like Florence Nightingale. Um, you know, he was, he was a good person. I, I hate that expression when people refer to each other as, oh, they were a good person. Not by God's standard. There's none good, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He was a religious rebel, a fanatic who opposed, you know, the establishment. He was a lunatic. A guy thought he was God. You know, a little wacky. But those are the assessments. Those are what people think. Or perhaps he was truly God in the flesh. He was or is Lord. Today, people have all those. And then probably a multitude more of opinions that, 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 that I didn't quite get. But let me digress for a moment and speak from my own experience. I was raised in a church, and I knew all about Jesus. I knew about the virgin birth. I knew he grew up, you know, um, was in the temple at 12 years of age, teaching. I knew that he um, had a public ministry. I knew that he was tried wrongly, wrongly accused and tried and convicted and sentenced and crucified, beaten, scourged, all of that. And he hung on a cross and he died. And I knew that he rose from the dead. I knew all about Jesus. Had the major facts, had the information necessary. But I didn't know him. I knew about him. And it's, that's frightening. Because my church taught me those things. But they also taught me all the pomp and circumstance being holy and, and, and um, just being a good person. And Jesus is watching. You know, I, I voted her blind and sinker. But as I've said so many times, um, close only counts in horseshoe pitching and hand grenade throwing. I didn't have a relationship with him. I knew he was God. But I knew God was God, and he was God. And, and I knew there was a trinity, a Holy Spirit. I didn't have any of that. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in sync. I wasn't functioning with that. And how, how sad to have all that information at your disposal and come to the wrong conclusion. Because really, I wasn't connected to Christ. I was connected to my church. And that was my salvation, my safety, my security. That, that was all of it. And I, at the tender age of 38, somebody told me about Jesus and that I could have a relationship. And I, I blew him off. You know, I, I, I didn't buy it. Come on, you know. But ultimately, he kept approaching from different angles, and he won. And I'm so glad he did. I'm so glad he did. Because as I said earlier, even, e even if what the Bible says about heaven wasn't really so, and maybe this life is over when you take your last breath, I don't believe that. But at the worst case scenario, if that were the case, I still had a much better life since I made that decision at 38 years of age. And that's 44 years ago. And God has been faithful ever since. I only asked one thing of the Lord when I came to Christ. Having spent 38 years in the army of the enemy, I asked God for an equal time provision. Could I at least have 38 years to serve him? And right now I'm on borrowed time. So um, I'm going to do the best I can with whatever is left. But he is a good and faithful God. Um, 
And um, let, let me say this. Um, let, let's look at the, the key answer here. The one that everybody focuses on. That's so profound. That's so right on. After they get done um, exhausting their uh, candidates, John the Baptist, Elijah, or the prophets, you know, Simon Peter answers, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Right answer. Final answer? Yes. Right. Good. The only problem is, you can have the right answer on the test and still mess up in the test of life. Peter got it right. Jesus said, man, you are open to the Holy Spirit. He just dropped that in you and you got it right. And Peter went on to serve God and deny him at the first opportunity. Failed. So what good was his having the right answer? The good was the fact that he repented and was restored. Rejected his Lord, but he repented and was restored fully, not partially, not temporarily, not on probation, totally. Forgiven, forgotten, and restored. So who do you say Jesus is? Does your life reflect your answer? Is your faith an insurance policy or an assurance one? Is your faith in Christ based on who he is, not just the, the benefits that go with, with signing up? Are you building a relationship with him day by day? Situation by situation, calamity after calamity, setback. Oh, God, my progress. I go one forward, two back. I'm losing ground. It's okay, because he's got your back. It's okay. Not every day is going to be uh, a progress and, and, and you tiptoe through the tulips. But is he real? Is his presence real? Does he have the preeminence? His presence is, are you aware that he's continually with you and in you and encouraging you and providing for you and protecting you? Do you know that? It's going to be so vital in the days that are coming. Things are not getting better, apparently. But we have. We have the hope, the promise, the assurance. Oh. I think back to the, you know, the saints of old. Abraham didn't have a clue, but he believed God. He didn't believe in God, he believed God. And it was attributed unto him for righteousness. Father Abraham, over the hill, his wife over the hill, barren, they had a, a slave. God says, no, you, you are going to find the multitudes. You will be able to count them. God kept his promise. Peter denied Christ. He repented and was restored. Let me just close with Matthew 10 and three verses. Verse 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't be afraid of the enemy. 
your God is greater than any challenge he will come up with. Embrace him. Know him intimately. Build. Secure that relationship. Verse 31. So do it. Um, 32, I'm sorry. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Wow. Let's conclude with four R's. Are you sure you have received Christ? Is it possible you might need to refresh yourself in Christ and rebuild that relationship? Is it possible you really have turned your back? Oh, and you're going through the motions. But there's no relationship. There's no, re there's no refreshing. There's no um, renewal. There's no uh, robust uh, intimacy. You might want to repent or restore. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning. Um, just where you are to consider are you honoring your commitment? Jesus honored his. Oh, he asked, he asked for now. He said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. God's plan of salvation existed before he ever created us. And he went through with it. What's our response? To that free gift of salvation. What's what what's our relationship? Is it kind of like, well, I haven't haven't heard from my relatives in a while. Maybe I'll drop a line, maybe I'll pick up the phone. Do you talk to them on a daily basis? Do you do you do you get input from them? Or is the call one way? Dear Lord, I love you. Listen to this. I this is going on. I need help over here. Don't forget that and then say, see you. Talk to you tonight. Good night, Lord. You know, are, 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 do you have a walking, living, lively relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God of glory? We're going to spend eternity with Him and each other. We can't even get along with each other down here. What are we going to do? I hope, I hope they're not on my block. Would you take a moment and would you consider? And I'll, I'll, I'll just pray. And you can ask God. Father, your word has, has, without controversy, established the fact that the only way we're ever going to know you is through your son. And Jesus, you asked the question, who do, you, who do you, individually, who do you say that he is? If he isn't Lord of all, he isn't Lord at all. But Jesus, if we got sloppy in our agape, in our love for you, forgive us. Lord, thank you that you are the God of not only a second, but of many chances. Lord, if we never really, never really surrendered to you, then this morning I want to do that. I want to admit I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I can't rescue myself. I can't save myself. But I know you can, and you willingly offer to do that. I receive that offer, but I need your help. I need to know I'm forgiven. I need to know I'm a new creation. I need to know that your grace will be sufficient in everything I face in my walk with you. Lord, if, if I've messed up and not acknowledged it, 
would you help me? Help me to face it and not make excuses. Lord, if my attitude, I may be a believer, but if my attitude stinks, if I've got that stinking thinking, would you clear that up? Would you um, deal with my sarcasm? Would you deal with my negativity? Would you refresh me? Refresh me. Fill me once again with your Holy Spirit. Because I leak, Lord. I need to be refilled. I repent. I ask for a, a time of refreshing. The book of Acts tells us that times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. You promised that if we would open our hearts to you, you would come in and take up residence. You would not only live in us, but you would never, never, never leave us nor forsake us. So, Lord, whether we receive you this morning or we have refreshed um, our relationship or who we've repented, um, would you restore us to right relationship with you, your Heavenly Father, Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might walk uprightly, not only before you, but with you. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' precious name. And the church said, amen. amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. I'm sorry we're still not released to have refreshments. <coughs> so you have to bring your own. I guess you need it. <coughs> eat it on the way home. But, um, <coughs> Well, until until things improve, um, we're going to hold off. But God bless you. Have an awesome week. Let this week be very different. Skip the same old, same old. Take him home with you. Know that he's there. Even if you're, if you're home alone, set another plate. Do something to remind you of his presence. Do something to acknowledge him. Come back next week with a smile on your face. Amen. Amen. God bless you.